Thank you. Um, as always, uh, there's always inaccuracies. Uh, that's my fault. Uh, it's, it's now 30 years at IBM. Um, so uh, I was born back in uh, a decade where people call us uh, baby boomers. Um, and uh, I originally studied um, applied physics and electronic engineering and uh, also computer science back in the days when there wasn't computer science, one of the very first degrees offered in computer science. And then I did a PhD in information theory. Information theory is basically it's group theory, number theory, a lot of kind of abstract and convoluted mathematics. And uh, little did I realize way back then that uh, actually 35 years later, so I did my PhD 35 years ago, uh, 35 years later, um, I would have a renaissance based on what I studied and all the stuff I learned back then. Um, because actually, with that, armed with those tools, you're pretty, you're, you're pretty well armed to understand, or at least to attempt to understand, because nobody really understands it, um, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and quantum computing. So I'm going to talk about IBM's quantum computing platform, um, including things like QuizKit, uh, the IBM Quantum Experience, and um, hopefully open some doors, make you think about, uh, about what IBM's doing in this space. And um, of course, the appeal to everybody um, to contribute to work with us. So let's see if this works. So the, I guess the, the fundamental question is, um, have we reached, and this is, this is our uh, IBM Quantum Cat. Um, the Quantum Cat, he's, he's thankfully alive and uh, not in superposition, and certainly not dead. Um, have we reached the limits of classical computation? So let's have a look at... Yes, I've been practicing this. I can see you're. Are you all impressed? <laughs> yes, this is this. <laughs> this is 30 years uh, working for IBM, practicing with Microsoft. Is there anybody from Microsoft here? <laughs> well, uh, Microsoft is love hate. Yeah, it's good for some things, but let's see what happens. I can hear the 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 the, the, the intake of breath here. Like, <gasps> how did he do that? <laughs> It's quantum. So this is, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is everybody's contemporary view of quantum computing. Um, for those of you who are observant, you've seen me before. I, I was sat on a step here, here doing some stuff. So I was, I was quickly writing my foils. Um, I just pulled these literally about, about three minutes old off Twitter. I thought that was quite nice. So we have, you know, we are, we have the picture of the chandelier. Uh, and it's cold, and it's even more cold. And um, down at the bottom, it's really, really incredibly cold. Um, and then we have some means of uh, mapping some real-world problem onto a, probably a Hamiltonian, probably using the Ising model. Um, and, and nobody understands what the hell it's all about, but um, it seems to work. Um, and of course, between this, I'm British, I'm allowed to be humorous, or at least I'm allowed to attempt to be humorous, uh, between this level and, um, um, and reality, there was a kind of mapping and some, some details we need to understand. Um, if we take a look at um, quantum algorithms in general, and we've heard some talks today about different approaches, um, how we might actually use quantum computing, um, but fundamentally we've got to actually understand a lot about how contemporary current algorithms work, what their limitations are, um, and how quantum computing might, might be able to improve that or bridge that gap. Is there anybody here with a background in theoretical computer science? OK. So I'm thankfully for the rest of you, and thankfully for me, because the theoretical computer scientists will be able to pick holes in it. I'm not going to go into a complete derivation of the BQP hierarchy class derivation. But it really, uh, <clears throat> in order to understand quantum computing, or the advantages, potential advantages of quantum computing, um, you need to understand a little, at least a little, little bit about um, theoretical computer science and algorithmic performance. 
In particular, as we'll see later, one concept which is quite key is the idea of uh, a quantum computer providing a supra-polynomial speed-up. Okay. It might be an exponential speed-up, uh, it might be something else, it might be supra-exponential, but it's at least supra-polynomial. Um, and we'll see why, why that's important in a few, few minutes. This is a foil which does not display, also not. Okay, so um, if we look at the class of algorithms which um, we're attempting to, to address with quantum computing, um, we have so-called easy problems. Uh, does anybody know how we classify or name those easy problems? Anybody got a, an idea? Polynomial. Polynomial. You've, for those of you, for the computer scientists, close your ears. For the rest of you, these are so-called polynomial time algorithms. So they're algorithms which are a polynomial in the size of the input, whatever that means. Yeah? Um, so classically, um, multiplying two numbers together is polynomial. Just in order to do that, I have uh, I need a number of operations, which is a which is a multiple of the size of the two numbers I'm trying to multiply together. Uh, we all know, we've all heard, or we should have all heard of Shor's algorithm. Who hasn't heard of Shor's algorithm? A couple of people. Okay, Shor's algorithm is a quantum. Uh, it's an algorithm which can be run on a universal quantum computer, um, which uh, provides a super exponential, a super polynomial speed up of factoring numbers. So multiplying numbers is polynomial. Determining if, if a number is a prime, does anybody know what that is? <laughs> it's polynomial. Factoring a number, an arbitrary number, into its prime factors is? Exponential. No, it's not polynomial. That's the whole, that's the whole basis of uh, cryptography, or at least most public key cryptography <laughs> relies on the fact that that is a non super polynomial. And uh, Shor's algorithm, unfortunately, can uh, factor in polynomial time. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of a small gotcha with Shor's algorithm. Um, so for, let's say, realistic numbers, realistic, uh, realistic sized numbers, you are almost certainly going to need tens or hundreds of millions of qubits. Um, currently, the, uh, the, the, the best uh, universal qubits, uh, the best we can achieve is uh, less than 100. Um, so we're a long way away yet, but maybe one day that will become feasible. Um, the original use case for quantum uh, computing was to simulate quantum mechanics. That's also uh, a quantum easy problem. We, somebody earlier talked about <coughs> how you can map in particular optimization problems using the variational quantum eigensolver onto a Hamiltonian equation. Hamiltonian equations are things you can relatively easily um, uh, solve or at least observe with a quantum computer. So there are some ways to approach specific problems. Um, but in general, we're looking for uh, hard problems. No? Typically, these are problems um, in the area of algebraic and uh, number theoretic problems. Um, also, optimization problems. And the optimization problem one is of one of the most interesting ones. And if I look at the, if I look at the space of uh, developers, startups, people who are actively working on and with, and especially with quantum computing and our, our APIs, there's a lot of companies in there in the finance space. Because um, if you look at hedging or portfolio analysis or economic prediction, these are all fundamentally optimization problems. Um, so there's this, you know, there's this, this idea that when quantum computing, when we get to quantum advantage, suddenly problems in the financial space or logistics, which are intractable today, will become tractable. And uh, I'm sure that will happen. And a result of that will be complete change in business, business models and how these, how these branches, how these industries work. Machine learning. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And of course, simulating quantum mechanics for chemistry, which is the area where we expect quantum advantage to occur 
earliest. Um, just to illustrate this, I don't know if anybody's seen this. Um, oh, I merely must apologize for HDMI and my, my, this is, okay. 26,000. <laughs> so, the question is, uh, the question was, okay. The IBM Blue Gene Q, yeah? Supercomputer. It can, this, this stuff you can't read, it's saying, so for a 512-bit number, how long would Blue Gene need to factor that? And the answer, which you can clearly see here, is 26,000 years. Um, okay, oh, it looks better. How long would it need for a 1,024-bit number? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, take Shaw's algorithm. Uh, that's the speed up. So that's super polynomial speed up. The small qualifier of this is that you need a fault tolerant quantum computer um, with around somewhere 10, 20, 30, 100 million qubits. So we're still not there yet. Um, how do we actually program a quantum computer? Now, um, there are a variety of approaches, but fundamentally it comes down to mapping in some way your problem onto an interference pattern, which is in this interference pattern you set it up on your qubits. Um, there are two mechanisms for doing that setup. There's uh, superposition and entanglement. So superposition, we've seen you know, the block sphere where you put an initialized qubit into a superposition of two states. Um, An entanglement is where I make two different qubits into one system, one quantum mechanical system. And um, the real challenge is, uh, given a, a real-world problem, for example, um, inverter matrix, how can I map that into a bunch of these types of operations? There was a question somebody asked earlier about mm, different types of Hamiltonians. Who was it? Somebody sat up here. Yes, you were asking about new Hamiltonians. Um, right now, um, we, uh, we have um, um, the superposition, the Hadamard transform, and the C not transform, those are things you can more or less easily implement in hardware. But obviously, there's a lot of people working on, I would say, higher level uh, fundamental Hamiltonian operations, which would, um, were they to exist, would also result in speed up in algorithms. So we take, we take a superposition of all the states. Um, this is actually, this bit is a lie, because in order to visualize multiple qubits with entanglement uh, using the block sphere, it uh, qu quickly becomes a problem that's uh, only understandable by pangalactic uh, transformational uh, hyperbeings. Um, I'm allowed to say that here because you're developers, and I can assume that some of you at least have read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Who hasn't? <laughs> So for the video, there is about three people put their hand up, and all the rest have read it. So you know what the mice are, right? The mice and the hyper... Okay. So only the mice can understand the, um, the hyperdimensional hyper um, uh, um, block sphere mapping. Um, there is a way to do it with two qubits, but it's extremely convoluted and not really very intuitive. Basically, we have uh, a way of entangling the, the qubits um, and, and making out of a, for example, 20-qubit quantum computer effectively one, one uh, consistent uh, quantum system. Um, and then the magic happens where we basically collapse the wave function we observe um, and out pops the result. Every quantum computing program, and I don't know if that's people really understand that, which is why I'm going to emphasize it again. Every quantum computing program is actually a circuit. So it's initializing a bunch of bits, performing some preparatory operations on those qubits, and then observing. There's no feedback. 
feedback is forbidden. So uh, reversibility and no cloning, two principal operation, principles of quantum computing. Um, and um, the output of this quantum program is non-deterministic. It's fundamentally non-deterministic. That means when you perform your experiment two times, three times, four times, five times, you never guarantee you'll always get the same result. If you're lucky and your algorithm is robust in non-determinism, then you'll, you get a very, very clear statistical correlation showing you one particular result. And then you've, assuming your algorithm, algorithm is designed well, you know, okay, that's the answer. There are also inherently in all quantum computers, because uh, even though, as we saw, the quantum computer is very cold, and it's in a, under high vacuum, and um, uh, there's very little electromagnetic radiation uh, impacting on it, um, it's still not perfect. So every operation on a qubit, whether it means putting it into superposition, or entangling it, or even reading it out, also introduces, by its very nature, because it's an interaction, introduces additional errors. And that, in fact, that's one of the major um, challenges in actually building real universal quantum computers, is to manage and handle those errors and keep them as low as possible. Um, when we talk about the power of a quantum computer, it's not uh, just important to talk about the number of qubits. Because, um, you know, what would 200 qubits, what benefit would they be if the individual qubit error rate completely dominates any calculation, otherwise the two, 200 qubits would be useless. I need to have a corresponding error rate which is s s correspondingly low in order to be able to actually make use of that. So there's always a trade-off between error rates, error rates in, in, ish, in uh, fundamental simple operations, in entanglement operations, in readout operations, the coherence time of a quantum program, which also, of course, determines uh, how many how errors uh, can add up, how errors are um, um, combined, <clears throat> and the number of qubits. At IBM, we talk about the quantum volume, which is a measure of number of qubits and the error rate. Um, also, of considerable interest is the coherence time, because that determines the maximum amount of time you have for your quantum program. And um, coherence times of the order of tens or maybe a hundred of microseconds are uh, normal. When you think about it, back in the day when, uh, when Deutsch, uh, Feynman and Deutsch were thinking about the principle of a quantum computer um, and that we might need such things, I can vaguely remember it. I was doing my PhD. Uh, early 80s, and I can remember this, this stuff about you know the idea of a quantum quantum bits, and I've I've, I've not not looked it up. I, maybe I have to do that, but I seem to remember that way back then the first attempts, the coherence times were measured in femtoseconds. So now we're in uh, tens or maybe even hundreds of microseconds. So we're a long way. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually significant uh, development. Um, so historically, quantum, uh, quantum computing was the domain of quantum, uh, say, the quantum scientists, physicists, chemists. Um, we're now at the phase where we're quantum ready. And we see this uh, IBM, uh, our, our uh, competitors, I don't like the word, our um, in German, Mitstreiter. Um, the people in the market, uh, in the quantum computing market with us, um, we all see a very, very big uptake, great interest in quantum computing. And right now, it's, the challenge is to understand how to program quantum computers, to demonstrate uh, as early as possible quantum advantage. And there is significant economic and uh, business um, interest and impact on uh, doing that. Um, and at some point in the hopefully not so distant, distant future, we will be in the phase of quantum advantage. So, um, this is a model or a mock up, or actually, it might be a photo of the one they actually built. I think it is. Anybody know this? 
Of course, your developers, hackers, you know it. So this is Charles Babbage's um, uh, computing machine. It's one component of it. It was never built because back in 1823, I think, or 1833, uh, they did not have the metallurgi metallurgical skills to produce uh, gear wheels of sufficient strength and uh, accuracy. It's, uh, I don't think it's a Turing machine, but it's pretty damn close. Uh, it's, no, it's a Turing machine, but it's, an, uh, it's a Turing machine, but I don't think it's a von Neumann architecture, it's but it's very close. So it has a CPU, it has registers, it has the idea of memory, a mechanical uh, von Neumann machine from 1823. So when my, I'm, I'm English, I'm British, and I've been living in Germany for 30 years, so one day after Brexit, I literally one day after Brexit, I applied for German citizenship, so I'm now German and British. Um, so when my Germans, German uh, fellow Germans, they all say, well, Konrad Suse invented the computer, and I pull this out and say, no, no, no. Nah, sorry, <laughs> not, not going to, no, no. All the best ideas that come from British people. <laughs> which, sorry, which, ra which raises a very pertinent question about what the hell Brexit is. Uh, well, here I am in the centre of the, uh, centre of, what, what was this, this would be the, this would be the, um, um, was in Star Wars, the, um, no, um, the star, the, 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 the Death Star. So Brussels will be the Death Star with, uh, with the EU Commission. I'm very pro-Europe, by the way. I, I, this is all. <laughs> anyway. So and this is, uh, this is where we are right now. So um, there are several of these, uh, an undisclosed number, uh, sitting at uh, a couple of locations, IBM locations. Um, you may have seen in the press uh, at CES a couple of weeks ago, we announced the first, uh, I would say, commercially available um, quantum computing system. So that's significant because um, that means we are moving from a pure research uh, model into a model where we're actually going to work with, we work with customers on developing applications. Um, and we use for our, um, for our qubits, uh, we use these babies here, superconducting Josephson junctions. There are several other approaches, um, some of which are actually in current use, some of which are currently only of theoretical interest because we haven't actually, nobody's actually observed them, uh, specifically uh, the entanglion approach. If anybody's not heard of entanglions, go Google it afterwards. Um, it's uh, entanglions. If we actually show that they exist and are able to use them, they will represent a, a very, very interesting technology uh, for the basis for quantum computing. Uh, the key point here is that the underlying technology, the methods of mapping quantum programs onto a specific technology, and the method of, uh, of mapping applications onto quantum programs, these three levels uh, we want to see these decoupled from each other. So um, such initiatives as Open Quasm for the, the layer between the quantum assembly language and the hardware, open standards for how you actually control and uh, control and operate a physical quantum computer, and also standards for how compilers are, are, are built. Um, that's all open source. I'll show you in a minute how to get get access to it. There's SDKs and APIs coming out of your ears on, uh, on GitHub. Um, but we're... So the, the important point here to note is this number here. Um, any electrical engineers or electronics engineers here? Yeah. yeah. So you know, yeah, Boltzmann's constant, uh, every... Uh, Particularly at microwave frequencies, you have equivalent temperature uh, and noise floors and all that sort of stuff. So before I got, came up here, I was down at the, um, the amateur radio bench down there, and because um, I'm a radio amateur as well, so talking to the guys about moon bounce and that sort of stuff. 
So this is all um, this is all very important when you're working at microwave uh, frequencies, low noise, and that's actually one of the one of the reasons why the quantum computer has to be so cold um, is that you need the noise, the environmental noise around the qubits, to be lower than the value, the equivalent temperature value of the one or zero. And uh, there we go. So 100 micrometers is, uh, is here. This device is, uh, f I guess, a few nanometers. Um, does anybody know if I have a gate, a physical gate on a chip with a size of, let's say, 10 nanometers? Anybody know how many silicon atoms are in there? I'm looking to the electronics engineers. Hmm? Fifty? Hmm? No, it's more. It's a, it's a, it's about, uh, it's about fifty or sixty. But it's still a sufficiently small number of electrons uh, of atoms that um, you observe. You don't observe. Your your gate is almost dominated by quantum effects, especially at room temperature, uh, which is why Moore's law is basically at least the scaling of gate size is is breaking down. The die size expansion is also kind of hits some limits. So that's what one looks like, or at least an IBM one. If you, uh, uh, you remember the photos from uh, Rigetti and D-Wave, their quantum computers look astound astoundingly uh, similar. Um, there's, that's not chance. Uh, that's kind of the way you have to do it. Um, the, inter the thing I always found fascinating was uh, this. See these little stripes here. And you can't see it down here. This is sort of a big block of thing here and some stripes here. It goes all the way up to the top. So the whole thing is cooled with helium-4. Helium-4 is the common isotope of uh, helium. Helium-4 has a boiling point of, I think, somebody probably going to correct me, about 3.5 Kelvin. There's an isotope of helium called helium-3. has one neutron less. Its boiling point is around 2.5. 7 Kelvin. You use the difference in a refrigerator to basically freeze down to 15, 10, 15 millikelvin. Um, interestingly, the amount of helium-3 on Earth is, is uh, rather restricted and uh, it doesn't occur very often spontaneously. So there's a... Uh, once you've put the helium-3 in the fridge, you don't let it leak. It's expensive. Um, so we saw one of these pictures earlier, 15 millikelvin down at the bottom, a bunch of microwave electronics. Um, what actually happens inside there, input-output modules, uh, a, a whole bunch of control electronics here. Uh, what you're seeing there is a photo of uh, one of the research machines. Obviously, in a commercial quantum computer, a lot of that's going to be miniaturized. And um, I'm sure at some point in the future, you'll have a pizza carton uh, control electronics for your quantum computer. For those of you who work in uh, in, in compute centers or in uh, in computing delivery, you know the term pizza carton. This is the affectionate term for the, the CPUs and memory and disk things you put into a 19-inch racks. They're called pizza cartons. So I'm sure that that will be a, a pizza carton, the control electronics at some point. And then, uh, of course, um, Compilers, APIs, SDKs, and uh, cloud access, and uh, HTTP wrappers, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so the idea is that we were going to replace uh, this with this. Uh, in a certain, actually, in a certain way, and I was at uh, where was I? I was in Berlin yesterday, in Potsdam, at the Hasso Plattner Institute. And they have a museum of computers there, so some very, very old PCs, you know, so VAX and PDP-11 and all this sort of thing. And these, the really, really old computers, you won't remember it, I do, but uh, um, to initialize the computer, to boot a computer, you had to physically enter the, the actual first memory locations by hand. It's actually very, very, it's a very good analogy for how we initialize and set up qubits. Um, you have to do it manually. Um, but a lot of people working on quantum memory and uh, quantum sensors, I'm sure that problem will 
at some point in the future also, if not go away, at least be uh, mitigated and improved. Um, so, this is, this is the bit where you roll your eyes because uh, it was going so well before and now he's not done it. So the, the key thing is I need to get the little, f ah, here we go, there we go. No, I already did this. Oops. Okay. Here we go. So, um, what is how is IBM um, how is IBM working with quantum? So there is a a whole bunch of stuff on uh, on GitHub. Um, there are various APIs. But uh, what we what we said is that um, basically a um, couple of couple of uh, toys and giveaways and there's a, an app for the uh, for iOS. There's even a board game called Entanglion, which is actually quite fun um, and undergo, undergoing revisions. And we've developed a uh, model Q keyboard. I'm not quite sure what the point is, but um, it's selling like hotcakes. Um, um, if you uh, if you don't like Jupyter notebooks, if you are the strange kind of person that doesn't like view Jupyter, is anybody here who doesn't like using Jupyter? I knew it was going to be you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I use it, but I, I don't like. It. Yeah. So you're obviously one of these people who insists on using Microsoft VS Code. Yes, we've got you covered. Um, so. If we look at the, this separation, so QuizKit Terra is basically it's the gate level. So in QuizKit Terra, you can do a Hadamard transform, you can do a CNOT transform, you can do XYZ, so you can do the, um, the Dirac um, manipulations. So it's very, very low level quantum computing. Um, it's really simple to install. Pip install QuizKit, that's it. Um, you need an API key. Um, there is, I'll show you how to do that in a second. Um, then we have something called QuizKit Aqua, and QuizKit Aqua is interesting because nobody's really addressed, has kind of addressed that, but um, what, what would it be like if I had, for example, in Python, an API call which said, calculate, uh, calculate binding energy, and I give it, open brackets, I give it my API key, and then I say, Hydrogen, lithium, hydrogen, close brackets. So where's the quantum computing? I don't care. You know, I'm just, maybe I'm using the quantum computer as a back end. Maybe I'm using a quantum computer simulator. Maybe I'm using a classical supercomputer. Maybe if it's only uh, hydrogen, lithium, hydrogen, I'm using my laptop. But if it's, a, if it's a caffeine molecule, I'm using the quantum computer. So for IBM, it's clear to us that the level at which you ultimately use quantum computing, you're not going to, you're not going to have to take care of are there actually qubits down there or not. And that's the, the level we work with with, with QuizKit Aqua. We, uh, we also have QuizKit Air, which is also uh, um, open source, publicly available. This is a, um, for access to and working with a quantum simulator. There are... There is a open source, publicly available quantum simulator out there. Um, you can use that. There is a, IBM has a, a variant of this that's behind air. Um, there is also QuizKit Ignis. QuizKit Ignis is part, or at least parts of it are in uh, QuizKit Terra. QuizKit Ignis, um, you get the analogy, Ignis is like the you know, the, the magma and uh, hot rocks underneath the Earth's crust. So QuizKit Ignis is all about manipulating and working with actual individual qubits and the technology itself. So it's below the waterline or below the crust of the planet. Um, we have a number of publicly available quantum computers. Um, Tokyo isn't publicly available. Po Tokyo is only available to uh, our customers. However, Melbourne and the other quantum computers are publicly available. You can go, uh, 
Mm. On the QuizKit website, uh, you can see the, uh, I just did this screenshot about, uh, about an hour ago. So you can see the current operating frequency. So if you remember beforehand, the 240 millikelvin the equivalent, uh, is the equivalent um, noise temperature of uh, a 5 gigahertz signal. We're operating at 4.9 gigahertz. You can see the, um, the um, related uh, timings for, um, for Tokyo, so coherence times. You can see uh, gate errors and uh, readout errors in and we make that all publicly available. We're very open about that. Why are we open about that? Because that actually determines uh, the performance or it determines whether your quantum computer is, uh, your, your quantum algorithm, your quantum program is actually going to work or not. In fact, the compiler that sits between QuizKit Aqua and QuizKit Terra, you can tell it, I don't really care which physical machine you use. Just give me the one with the, slow, the shortest queue. Or give me the one with the lowest error. If you look at the uh, actual, the, this is the topology here. So this, is, this basically says that qubit 0 and 1 can be entangled with each other, but 0 and 6 can't. Yeah, they can't. So the, where there's a connection, there's entanglement possibility. Um, Interestingly, this one here looks totally different from this one. So Melbourne is a kind of, it's like a very, very linear. Uh, Tokyo is a, a mesh. Wouldn't it be nice if uh, you're, at least at the application level, the compiler took care of that and said, well, just give me your, just give me your topology and I will map it to whatever is available. So we also do that. Um, go on to GitHub, please. It's all open source. Hack it, improve it. Um, it's, in, it's it's being recorded, so I hope uh, nobody from IBM sees this. But we actually uh, we've had a lot of input from people outside IBM who've uh, made some of the software significantly better. Um, <laughs> okay, you're all developers. I'm allowed to say that. Uh, nobody's going to hoist my petard for that one. Um, so you can see up here, uh, there's 177 repositories in total working with and on and related to QuizKit and uh, um, around 2K commits. Um, so we have some people out there working very actively with this on developing this software and using it, but actually developing the, the API itself. Um, if, you wanna, if you want to sign up then, and you're a student or a faculty member or a PhD student or whatever at any accredited academic institution, please go via On The Hub, sign in there. If you're not in that category, so if you're a working developer earning real money with a real job, um, then just go on to the quizkit.org. It's all free. Um, we also have some uh, interesting, interesting uh, collaboration possibilities for uh, developers for startups, uh, if you want to talk about that, just let me know. Um, and I would say with that, how many minutes have I got left? One. Um, one plus questions for one minute. Okay, so at that point, I have got about another 300 foils. Uh, seriously, I do have another 300 foils, but they go into, go into things like machine learning optimization in some detail. But uh, I think that's enough, at least initially, um, just give you a feel for where IBM is and uh, I'll take some questions. Yes. Uh, the, the thing is, uh, the first internet is not directly connected to the IBM quantum computing, but uh, I read in the internet this preparation of talks today of some Gil Kalai who said that at some point so the question was, um, yeah, you'd heard of or seen something about uh, a comment that uh, all quantum computing problems will be, what was it, quantum? Uh, to, to combat noise, quantum computing uh, works uh, at qubits. 
but every kind of every qubit kind of increases noise level, and he predicted it to be exponential. Exponential. Yeah. Okay. So kind of at some point, you you add more noise than you you find. Yeah, I, I'm familiar with this. This is the uh, the noise beats everything uh, uh, principle. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm I'm not into that enough to be able to comment on whether on the validity of it or. I mean, speaking as an engineer, I understand the argument. However, back in the 1960s, when I first took a soldering iron into my, into my hand, uh, and I look at the size of uh, integrated circuits back then, and the performance, and the Intel 4040, which was the first 4-bit microcomputer on a, on, a, on a chip with a clock frequency of, I think, 60 kilohertz, um, and the performance figures and noise figures and capabilities, and compare that with the uh, couple of billion transistors on this, um, I wouldn't want to bet on uh, noise. I mean, noise, noise is always a problem now. Yeah. You can't get away from it. But uh, I think where we are currently with the noise ceiling, um, we're going to push that way, way back. So there was another question. Hold on, hold on. Here. So I wanted to ask about the quantum volume. So yes. So what's the quantum volume of current chips? Uh, yes. Like your, for example, Tokyo? Yes. Well, of course. Well, the question is, he wanted to ask about quantum volume. And what's the quantum volume of our current chips, like Tokyo? The best in the market, of course. <laughs> No, um, yeah, we think we think we think we are uh, uh, among the best. No, I mean the, the what, what quantum volume is exactly? There is a formula, um, <clears throat> and you can think about you know like qubit equivalent or noise equivalents. Um, ultimately, it's it's the idea is just to have an awareness of okay. it's not just the number of qubits. Yeah, you can. You could make a chip right now with, a, with lots and lots of qubits, but it would be useless because noise would dominate. You need to do both. So hold on. Before the question here, there was a question back there. Oh, yeah. Can you talk more about Quizkit Aqua and how that chemistry API works? Like, how are you able to implement something that's so general? Can I talk about Quizkit Aqua and how the chemistry API was implemented? Uh, yeah, that's a three-day intensive course at university. Um, um, basically... <laughs> Basically, if you're right now, if you're developing quantum algorithms, you have four, maybe five ways to do it. The ones already been mentioned is using oracles. So can I decompose my problem into such a simple fundamental building block that I can reproduce it? Scott Aronson, the, uh, the, the father of computational complexity theory, would, would, you know, would, be, would be shooting me right now for claiming that. Um, the second way is can I... Can I adapt my problem to a Hamiltonian of some kind? We already saw that with, uh, so D-Wave uh, uh, are using that, but uh, Regretti, everybody's using that, using the variational quantum eigensolver. Take my problem and map it to a Hamiltonian. The third way, Peter Shaw kind of did it without realizing it, is there's this really, really, really neat, nice, nice thing. And if you're an electronics engineer or a communications engineer, it's, that's the point where you have uh, a Leuchtung. Um, uh, Enlightenment is that the, the Fourier transform, which is in the real world, sucks computationally. And a quantum computer is a thing of beauty. It's fast and it's simple. So if you take <coughs> the hidden subgroup problem, which says, I've got a group of things. Are the two, two subgroups which are isomorphic, which map one to one to each other? It's a combinatorial problem. Basically, to answer that, you've got to, you've got to look at every possible subgroup. So for a group of size n, it's 2 to the n computational steps. The quantum Fourier transform, you just, uh, you just do a Fourier transform of it, and you see, tzak, all the isomorphic subgroups appear as like frequencies when you do a, a normal Fourier transform. That technique, <coughs> you can use that to do, use, to do phase estimation. With phase estimation and arbitrary rotations, you can do the HHL algorithm. You can do matrix inversion. So you take a Gaussian elimination, which is n cubed, and turn it into uh, HHL, which is log n. <coughs> there are a few other techniques. Somebody's standing up, which means I've got to shut the hell up. 
if you want to talk about that, if you want to learn about that, if you want to work on that, sign up. There's a, there is a Slack channel. Uh, there's a whole bunch of IBMers on the Slack channel. We're very happy to talk to you. Have I got to stop now? Yes. <laughs> I'm around today and I'm around tomorrow. So just hit me if, you, uh, if you've got questions or you want to know more.